Stanford University. Um, so just to provide a quick background of our superstar teaching team, um, I'm just going to start from the left and then we'll go all the way to Tom Watson. Um, so Bill Coleman over here was um, currently as a partner at the Venture Capital Firm, Al Salfley Partners. Formerly, he was um, one of the assigned names was his Forbes cover story because he's also been a successful entrepreneur. He was formerly uh, the president and founder of EPA Systems, which uh, was the fastest software company to reach one million in revenue and currently still holds that title. Um, it was sold to Oracle for $8.5 billion. Um, he founded, he was also a former vice president of uh, Sign Microsystems and uh, on the board of uh, Symantec, several large software companies, and um, holds his degree from the US Naval Academy as well as Stanford in computer science. Well. Air Force. So. Air Force. Don't. <laughs> Air Force is better. So, um, and then, Tim, do you want to talk about David Hornet is a partner at August Capital. Before that, he was a lawyer at Perkins Coie, Cravat, Venture Law Group. Um, with August Capital this past year, he uh, invested in Splunk, which IPO, and that actually has the record for the highest IPO jump in a single day. And um, he got his undergrad at Stanford in Computer Music. And then he went to Harvard Law School, and um, we're going to have him talk today about his career path and how he went from law into venture capital. And then finally, Tom Hosick over here is one of the coolest professors at Stanford, if you haven't taken a class with him yet. Um, he works with the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, which is an entrepreneurship center housed within the School of Engineering. Um, he teaches a few core classes within the management science and engineering department, specifically focused on marketing. Um, he also advises uh, to students in um, Singapore as well as all over the place, um, Vietnam, Asia. He teaches all over the world. You'll be amazed. It's very hard to track him down um, because he teaches everywhere. Um, he also advises several startups around um, Silicon Valley. And um, one thing, uh, one of his latest projects has been Gira, which um, one of the scientists summarizes his product called Gira, and he's also going to discuss that too. Um, really excited to have um, such a wide and varied and awesome teaching team, ranging from a former entrepreneur, current venture capitalist, former lawyer, current venture capitalist. So you have both sides of the tables, as well as someone who's um, been teaching entrepreneurship um, and marketing um, for the past several decades. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, with that, I guess we'll just uh, start off with David Warren. So Ernestine and I have prepared a bunch of questions, but we're going to definitely make sure there's time for anyone in the class that has to ask the questions they want to teach and teach. Oh, yeah. Dave, can you talk about um, your career and how you got to connect with Catholic given a wall back now? Well, how much time do I have? I have like the five minute version of that, I have the 45 minute version of that. 15 to 20. Uh, uh, 15 to 20, that's how yeah, much? 15 to 20. Um, it was arbitrary. I mean, I when I uh, I'm actually a freshman advisor uh, here at Stanford, and and I, and I and I do it because I want to basically say, look, the the goal when you get here is to pursue the thing that you're passionate about, and it'll be fine, right? You know. And I had to tell my parents that when I ended up majoring in computer music, because you know, it's hard to imagine uh, going in saying, you know, I'm going to be a computer music major, and then it'll be great. I assure you, you won't be supporting me for the rest of my life. Um, uh, but that is what happened. I, I got here. I grew up. I grew up in New Hampshire. My dad was one of the early computer scientists uh, at Digital Equipment Corporation, and so we were. And DEC is a business that. How, how many people have heard of DEC? It's sort of amazing, right? This, you know, it was the. It was like Google or you know or uh, it's or Apple scale business at at, at the time. Um, and so I grew up in a house that had lots of computers, and uh, and and they and they were sort of second nature. I loved them, but it was never my intention to be involved in computers or be a computer scientist. I was deeply passionate about music, but I was also uh, an extraordinarily argumentative uh, young man. And I think everybody acknowledged that I would be a litigator when it was all when all was said and done. There were all sorts of things I could do on the path there that would be fine. But in the end, my profession would be to argue for a living. Um, and, uh, and in fact, when I ultimately became a venture capitalist and I described the job of venture capital to my mother, my mother said, wow, you mean you found a job, you talked your way into a job that only involves talking. And I said, exactly. And she was like, genius. You know, you, 
you have succeeded. You know, what, what could be better after not being a litigator and suing people? So, uh, so I, I finished up here with, a with my degree. I thought actually I was going to be a public defender. So I went off and did a master's degree in criminology in, uh, in England at Cambridge. Uh, incredibly interesting, made it perfectly clear how dysfunctional our, our, uh, our uh, penal system is. And then I went and went to law school and had every intention of being a public defender uh, until I was one. And uh, I briefly, uh, I took this great class and you got to actually go into Roxbury, really tough neighborhood and represent uh, uh, basically guilty people. And, um, and it was the first lesson where I learned that actually what my passion was was, uh, was not the law, but was something different. Uh, but, it only, but it was 10 years later before I realized that, because while all my classmates in, in, in this class were busy trying cases, right? You'd get evidence and you'd try and suppress it, or you'd try and, you'd have to, you'd try and figure out how you could have some great hearing so you could be victorious against the, the prosecutor or whatever. I was settling cases. I settled everything. Because it became instantly clear to me that trying cases was getting me nowhere. You were like this snotty little jerk, as far as they were concerned, coming out of Harvard to Roxbury. They hated you. They all hated you. And you weren't going to make a lot of progress there. And all of my clients instantly admitted to me that they were guilty of whatever it was they said they were accused of. And I would say, really? You know, like, I'd say, oh, what happened here? And they'd go, well, I was smoking pot. And then, you know, go, oh, OK, well, whoops. You know, I beat up my girlfriend for the second time, but I didn't mean to. It was really drunk. And it's like, oh, all right. And so I basically went and settled all these cases. I'd go to the, to the DA and I'd say, hey, like, you know, I've talked with him and he's extraordinarily remorseful and he absolutely wants to engage in, uh, uh, in, in uh, counseling. And so what, can we work something out? Like, can we do some kind of counseling thing? And, and I'd get these unreasonable deals, like completely despicable deals because, um, you know, because I was kind of this cute little guy and I was like, hey, come on, <laughs> be nice. Uh, and so my classmates, while they were in this class, did five or six cases in a semester. I did 13. I just pounded through them. And, and when I finished off, I thought, oh, my, my advisors are going to be so angry about this, the way I have engaged in this class. And instead, they recruited me heavily to both teach the class and to, to be a public defender. They're like, oh, my god, you understand public defense in, innately. <laughs> like, this is what we do, right? We settle the shit out of it. Uh, and so, uh, so anyway. I didn't. I, did, I, I didn't become a public defender. I went off, I clerked for a judge, and I became a lawyer. Um, but it became clear to me that really everything about business, everything about the law was about engaging with people and, and these negotiations, these daily negotiations. Even trials ultimately were about daily negotiations, about, about common sense. Um, and, uh, it, but I got sick of fighting all day. In fact, my wife said at some point, you know, David, I'm tired of, uh, I'm tired of this idea that we wake up and then we fight because you're just getting warmed up for work. <laughs> like, you know, that doesn't, and I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so I was talking to a buddy who was in my freshman dorm here at Stanford, and, uh, and, I, and he was working at a law firm called Venture Law Group, and the reason he was working there is that our friend of ours from our same freshman dorm was Jerry Yang, who founded Yahoo. And in fact, five of the first 10 people in Yahoo were our dorm mates of ours in Branner. And so, he said, hey, David, you know, here's what we're doing. There's the startup world, and Jerry's doing this cool thing and whatever. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. Maybe I should come do that. And they said, OK, why don't you come out and interview? And next thing you know, I went from representing big companies being sued to representing little companies that were trying to build big businesses. And truthfully, at the time, I come from this long line of socialists. My grandfather ran, was the editor of a socialist newspaper. And, uh, and so, you know, he st when my dad, my dad w was uh, studied education. And when he finished his degree, uh, he was a teacher. And when he left teaching, to, he formed a computer pro uh, company to provide computers to education. Like he was supposed to provide, he was providing the first time sharing systems for schools. And my grandfather stopped talking to him for a year and a half because he was no longer a teacher. You know, uh, so I, this is my history. And so corporations are evil. Like corporations represent all that is wrong in the world. And so the idea that I suddenly was now representing them was sort of this shocking uh, thing for me. And I thought that it would be fine, but I would ultimately get out and go in house to a company because I had little kids, and it would, I, you know, that would be more interesting. Um, but I discovered that startups are the most amazing, completely captivating uh, things I've ever, I've ever experienced, with the possible exception of my children, don't tell them. Uh, and so I just was 
completely intoxicated with startups and this idea that you're working with incredibly smart people who are wildly passionate about changing something, something as stupid as I'm gonna, you know, better payroll or uh, how to create an online calendar or whatever. Um, and so suddenly what I thought was gonna be a job became a, com a complete passion and addiction. And uh, I started working day and night with these startups. This is in the late 90s. And, um, and I couldn't get more, I couldn't get enough of their business. The law was fine, I was writing contracts for them, I was helping them raise money, but what was interesting to me was how they were growing these businesses, how they were you know, figuring out how to find markets, how they were figuring out how to, uh, you know, to create relationships and partnerships and grow and, and, you know, and, and really quickly suddenly becoming big businesses, going from three people to, to, to 100 people. I, unfortunately, I wasn't representing you because zero dollars to a billion dollars in how many years? Six years is, is insanity. Like, you know, it's so fast, it's like this. You know, it's that kind of, that's like mind blowing fast, but also completely exhilarating in the same way that that is, you know. Um, and so I was in love with startups and I, was I did everything in my power to be engaged in the business of these startups, even though I was technically their lawyer. So I would show up at their offices and I would interview candidates for VP of marketing or whatever. And meanwhile, they're paying me 400 bucks an hour to do this, which, Struck me as insane, but awesome. And, um, and I was on the board of, or I was representing a, uh, this company, Evite, which everybody's probably gotten an Evite. And, um, and I would sit in these board meetings and I would do what I should not have done, which is I would give my opinion. <laughs> that was not my job as a lawyer. My job as a lawyer was to shut up and tell them when they were about to break the law. Um, but it just struck me like, oh, why don't you talk to so-and-so? Or, you know, if you could bring content in, that'd be interesting or whatever. And uh, in one instance, they, this got me fired. But in this particular instance, the, the VCs on this, uh, it, that were on the board of this company said to me after, the, after one meeting, have you ever thought about the venture business? And I said, yes, thank you. you know, yeah, I'd love to talk to you about your business. And, uh, and four months later, they offered, a job, offered me a job uh, at August Capital saying, hey, lawyers suck at this job and we think you'll fail but we really like you and so <laughs> we're willing to let you risk it if you're willing to risk it and I was like of course that's a no-brainer um, and that was 13 years ago and so uh, it's been an incredible ride and, and, and the venture business has been one of the greatest you know just ever-changing exciting horrifying depressing uh, wonderful jobs you could ever imagine how long was that too, too many minutes. Too many minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, t it's passion. Uh, I wrote a blog post. I have a blog called Venture Blog, and I just wrote a blog post. Um, and the blog post was about passion, and it basically described my process when I fund a company. And how it's ref and and it's clearly reflected in startups. In fact, I I backed this incredible entrepreneur, a guy named Danny Shader, and Danny has been involved in, in a number of businesses. Sold his first company to Amazon. It was the only uh, legitimate competitor to PayPal, and uh, and now I'm an investor in his newest company that's called Pay Near Me, which allows you to pay cash uh, for online transactions. You go to 7-Eleven, you give them 40 bucks, and something's shipped to you, and then you know through the internet or whatever, and. Um, and Danny said, oh, I read this, I read your blog post and it's exactly what I tell entrepreneurs. And what that is, is basically if you, if you wake up thinking about something, then it, it matters. If you go to bed thinking about it, it's important. So my process is to meet with, you know, I get a thousand plans in my email in the year or so. And of those thousand, a hundred of them are interesting enough that I say, why don't you come spend an hour with me and tell me about your business? That hour is just an audition. It is not to convince me of anything except that what you're doing is exciting and that you love it. At the end of that hour, if I am more excited, more engaged in what you're doing than I was at the beginning of the hour, now we're on to something. But what I say in this blog post is that my biggest tell is doesn't matter what I've been doing that day when I lie down to go to bed. You know when you go to bed and you lie down and you close your eyes, you, have, you almost never simply fall asleep, instantly fall asleep. Even when you're in college and getting way too little sleep, you still have like a moment and a half where your brain ticks through something like, oh, tomorrow I have to wear those black pants or, oh, you know, my daughter is insane now or whatever. That's me. Uh, she just turned 13. Uh, but if, my, if when I lie down, my brain says, 
oh wow, you know what would be really amazing is if that such and such thing that I just saw became bigger or what, you know, if my brain does that, now we're onto something. Uh, now I'm, you know, now I'm engaged in you as a team and the product you're building and, uh, and then I'll spend another, you know, bunch of hours trying to get to know you as, te as a team and as people and, and how are you, in, how are you, why are you excited about this and are you excited about it and what is it you're trying to build and, uh, but it's really about that passion that you, uh, that you can exude and how it, imp you know, how it, how it uh, takes over me, <laughs> that, uh, that is the biggest pro part of the process. It's over. We should all go home. <laughs> go home and call it a day. Um, the, the markets are cyclical. Life is cyclical. It's all cyclical. But it's never like this incredible path to, to, to nothing. <laughs> uh, I am but part of being an entrepreneur, part of being a venture capitalist is ultimately that you're a mind-bogglingly, completely uh, inexcusable optimist. <laughs> so, so I should say, I should start with that. This is the massive asterisk, which is you shouldn't believe a word I say because I'm, I, I have such rose-colored glasses that I, you know, that I couldn't, you know, if I was about to be hit over the head by a giant hammer, I wouldn't notice it because I'd be like, what a nice wind. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, but that said, when, when Facebook went public, uh, I wrote a, or another blog post, and the blog post basically said, congratulations for the best deal yet, right? It was the best venture capital investment yet, but I believe that there will always be great, new, exciting, important technologies that, uh, that are built, and, uh, and Silicon Valley and, and, and this country and this world depend on them. And, you know, look, whether that's harder or easier to go public or whatever is sort of irrelevant. If you build something amazing that's transformative and important, there will come a time when you can monetize it. In the meantime, uh, you know, there will be a market for it. There will be an opportunity to grow. It will have a positive impact on the world and, and that will be valued and, and, and create value. So, you know, What's it like the next six months? Who cares? We've got decades of, of time and opportunity. Do something you care about that is transformative and important, and you, it will always uh, create value in the end. My favorite kind of question is last. Yeah. How involved are you in the Depending on who you ask, too involved or <laughs> not enough. Um, my view of venture business, I had a, a, a um, a very a famous entrepreneur come into my office, <coughs> Williams, and uh, and he and he looked at me at the end of the pitch and he said to me, "So what are you going to do for us? Like you know, if you were to invest in Twitter, what would you do for us?" And I said, quite sincerely, "What do you want?" And he looked at me angrily, like, "What do you do? Like what do you you know, what do, what is it?" What do you offer as a venture investor? But I was completely serious. My view is that the, the venture business is a service business, right? That in the end, VCs are there to help facilitate growth and, and value in the businesses that they fund. And every business is different, right? Every business, some entrepreneurs have, are first time entrepreneurs and, and they need lots of help in thinking through how to create structures and how to build you know, organizations and those things. Other people, you know, Danny Shader doesn't need my help in that. The guy knows how to build a great organization. He will build an amazing organization. You know, in that instance, it's thinking more broadly about you know, markets and applications. It's, and you know, VCs are often involved in things like recruiting great team members. We're involved in, uh, you know, we're, we'll help you raise money. We'll help you go public. But we'll also you know, have a very broad perspective of the world. Uh, we see lots and lots of interesting things, and hopefully, it's a you know VCs are curious, and and the natural relationship with you know with their companies is to say, I really care what you're doing, and I view the world through your prism, right? Every time I invest a new company, suddenly it's like I you know I, I, I funded uh, the, the first online payroll company. Say, so, oh payroll, like how boring. But suddenly everything was payroll to me. Like, oh my God, if you suddenly move cross border, that'd change everything. Now you have to have different withholding, you know? That's just, so I think that, you know, we see things broadly and we try and bring our experience and our help to bear to, um, you know, to, to be helpful to our companies. And sometimes that 
means meeting all the time uh, when things are getting entered in, in, you know getting exciting you're trying to sell the company or take it public or go out of business and sometimes you're just available for a call yeah imagine in your interview that one of the parallels between being a lawyer and being a venture capitalist is obviously uh, logic can you uh, just give an example of that as a venture capitalist how you apply logic uh, yeah, sure. I mean, ultimately, the po we are always making guesses about the future, right? I mean, the vi if it was just okay, here's a thing, and it's already done, and just and and all we have to do is apply. You know, you know, will you be better at it because you're a group of people who are doing exactly the same thing better? It's not really a venture investment. It's almost always, in particular in the tech world, we see all these trends and we think that we can do this new thing out in the future, right? And um, and the thing that's interesting in the venture business is you literally never have all the information, right? You just, it's, it is literally impossible to have all the information one might want or need to come to some answer. And so, uh, so you have to take all the data points you can possibly gather, and then you have to, you know, put them together in your head and predict using logic, the, you know, whatever logical constraints you can in the future. And, you know, I was giving a talk recently, and, uh, and, the, and the person who was questioning me knew me well, and he said, so David... Um, I know that you're dyslexic, and, and has that frustrated you because you can't read everything? You know, you can't, there's all this data and you can't consume it all because it's slow, because you're dyslexic, et cetera. And I said, you know, that's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about it, but the reality is that it's made me, I think, in many ways, w well equipped for this job because I literally never have all the information. I don't have all the information in a sentence. <laughs> you know, never mind all the information I need for, um, you know, to make a decision. And so everything you do is about taking the data points you have and extrapolating out into the future. And, um, and that's, you know, and, and that's, a, um, that's a challenge. And, you know, oftentimes you're wrong. You get new data points and you go, oh, <laughs> if I had that, I would have known that this is a terrible investment, you know, but uh, you only get what you get. Last question for David. Um, you'll have time to scroll forward and ask questions. That's right, forever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do you feel about the kind of trend of the value-added services that a lot of this is going towards? Is that We're going to dive right in. Um, and I'm on tape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so those of you who don't know, the question is basically, there is a trend, and it's primarily been instigated by a firm called Andreessen Horowitz, to create a bunch of, you know, a bunch of help to have a lot of people available in your venture fund to help you do things like recruiting or hiring engine or, or uh, PR or whatever. And so, uh, and so, the, so, you know, first of all, this isn't new. <laughs> you know, they may think they've invented it, but it isn't new. It happened in the late 90s. People thought, oh, we got to differentiate ourselves and things are moving so quickly and so we should hire a bunch of this and that. In fact, I, as an attorney, was being recruited by a number of firms to be that legal person at firms. Um, and so what happened? It was stupid, right? It turns out that it doesn't meaningfully increase the value available to a startup. It's not, you know, what we want when we're funding startups is to have incredibly smart, thoughtful, hardworking entrepreneurs build an, a great team around them, right? That doesn't include you using, you know, my outsource services as a crutch for things that you should be being you should be experts at right and so i think there's a great temptation there's a temptation to say oh well these you know there's an opportunity to to get you know recruiting help or this help or that help but the reality is you're building a business right and you should want to control it my partner dave who was uh, dave markort who was the only uh only investor private investor in microsoft and has been on that board now for slightly over 30 years said if you had offered Bill Gates these services, he would have said, I don't want your, I want, I'm in charge here. I'm not interested in your crap, you know? And I think that's the reality is that, that startups are about entrepreneurs controlling their own destiny and that's what it should be. So uh, it's been a great story. It's been very, it's, uh, it sells well, it seems sexy. I just don't think it actually makes, makes, uh, makes it any more likely that you will succeed. I think it, you know, I think that, uh, I think what you should look for is the best person who can, who you have the best relationship will be the most helpful to your business. Enough of me. Thanks, David. Um, so Tom Posnick, I believe you have a slide deck. So 
I have to follow him. I thought Bill was going to follow him. Yeah. 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 Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Not why did I play that video? Because I often will play it when we meet a group of entrepreneurial leaders. The question is, what is it that the people in that video, the girl who was afraid to jump into the pool, the cancer patient, the boy who was keeping his dad from beating up his mom, the magician who was in a rough neighborhood, etc. what do they have to, in common with you as the next generation? of entrepreneurial leaders. And some of you have had this question from me before, so please don't tell the answer. Take um, about 30 seconds and talk to the people who are sitting nearby, and uh, then we're gonna find out what you think, okay? What does that video have to do with you? Okay, who'd like to start? Who'd like to start? They're overcoming their fear. Absolutely right, and that's what we have to do as entrepreneurs. What else? What else? That's a big piece of it. Yes. Overcoming fear. They'll they'll have talents uh, or especially things about them push people around them and all chaos. Absolutely true. What else? Each of you has a unique something in you. I have no idea what it is. I didn't know what mine was till I was 40. But just the fireworks represent you releasing that uniqueness to the world. You taking, overcoming your fear. And even though people around you may not realize what it is, if you think you know what you're supposed to be doing to change the world, take the leap. Take the leap, let it shine. You may make mistakes along the way. You may, you may think well, what I'm really supposed to be doing is X. And the nice thing about trying X, if it turns out not to be the right thing, you can move on to something else. Think of the cool story that David told us about his life. He spent a whole lifetime doing really cool stuff that he enjoyed until he found the thing that he loves most for now. And who knows, it may change. So please remember that and talk to yourselves about it as you go through the quarter because in addition to all the really cool things that you're gonna find out by looking at entrepreneurship through the lens of venture capital, and this course is the best thing on earth to, to get that insight, you will learn a lot from each other, especially if you're willing to say, number one, I think I really wanna do X or I think I have a talent to do Y, but also to ask, what do you think I'm good at? Not just what do I need help with, because plenty of people will tell you where you're screwed up, but what, what are the things about me that if I really worked on them, you think would make me a better leader, a better entrepreneur, and somebody who could really fulfill my ambitions and change the world, okay? Now, um, I am anal retentive, and when I got my assignment from Tim, it was longer than what I'm gonna present today, and I went, oh shit, I have at least 15 hours worth of stuff that I could do, and as a typical professor, instead of doing what David did very brilliantly, was simply being himself and engaging and so on, I worked on slide decks. So what you're, <laughs> what you're gonna do is very quickly, we're gonna run through this, and I promise I'll go no more than 15 to 20 minutes, I'm timing myself. Um, I got 11.46 to hit the 15 minute mark. Okay, first me, and then the Valley, and then the Evolution, and VC Trends, and then the role of Stanford, Circles of Influence, a little book that we've written and never published, and then what it means for you. Um, I was born in 1950, um, hit university, and came out in 1972 with a low draft number, so I joined the Marines to avoid the draft. That's a story we'll tell later. Um, and then when I got back uh, from, from uh, finishing up uh, three and a half years in the Marine Corps, I said to my dad, what should I do? Become a Jesuit priest or go to business school? Now my parents had wanted me to be a doctor or a priest, but my dad said, are you ready to give up 
women? And I said, uh, no. <laughs> and he said, get an MBA. There are a lot of Jesuits with MBAs. You can always become a Jesuit later if you want. And I said, okay. And very soon thereafter, fell in love with my wife, uh, Jill Somerville. And believe it or not, um, I don't have the band on today because I had surgery on the second and she took the wedding band home with her to protect it and I haven't gotten it back yet. Anyway, um, so, so um, what, what, what this is basically saying is got an MBA at Virginia, fell in love, got married, went to Switzerland and worked for a year writing cases, trying to figure out, because in 1976, they asked us the question, where do you want to be in the year 2000? And in 1976, I said, I want to be living in a warm climate by the sea, teaching part-time at a college or university and consulting on the side. And so I got there in 89, and Stanford's pretty close enough to the sea. Um, I joined a startup called American Management Systems after business school, um, had a fun with them, learned a lot, worked with Lotus, um, went to Stanford. Well, how did Harvard get ahead? No, 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 that's right. So I came here to get a PhD in marketing at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Entrepreneurship was big here even then. In fact, a guy named Irv Grosbeck, who's still here, was here when I was a PhD student. And Jim Collins was four doors down the hall from me and a fantastic guy who we had a chance to do some really cool stuff with. Then I went back east to Harvard Business School to learn how to teach, came back uh, at Jill's insistence in 1989 after four years of um, Boston drivers and snow. She said, I'm going back to California, would you like to come? And I said, okay. So in 1990, we started uh, teaching here at Stanford, teaching not entrepreneurship, but technology marketing. Taught that in the engineering school. I actually taught here in the GSB, the introductory marketing course. And Laureen Jobs, um, was one of my students. That's about the only claim to fame that I have coming out of that particular course. Uh, but I, I did have a chance to meet Steve Jobs briefly once or twice, and he is certainly a hero. Uh, okay, so I get back in 1990, I'm teaching. Um, I, I get talked into going back to Harvard from 94 to 97 while I'm still teaching at Stanford. And a guy named John Quelch said, you're going to start the first entrepreneur, entrepreneurial marketing course at Harvard Business School. I said, no, I'm not. I don't know jack about entrepreneurial marketing. I know about high-tech marketing, Microsoft and Oracle, da, 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 da. And he said, Tom, when you started working with those companies and writing cases and you know, consulting with them and stuff, how big were they? And I went, um, and he said, you're going to teach the class. So I taught it. And then two years later, we imported it to Stanford. We added the G word, global entrepreneurial marketing, in 1998. Until now, we've taught that. How am I doing? I'm looking over at my. I'm, no, no, no. Okay, down to uh, eight minutes and 15 seconds. The things that are happening on the bottom are companies I've had the good fortune to, to work with, not all of them. There are a lot of startups that are not on there. And the things on top are the academic institutions with which I'm associated. And so um, you'll see in addition to the Department of Management, Science and Engineering and the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, how many of you actually have come into contact with those two things? A number of you have. I'm very lucky to have had some of you as students who worked with you at Basis and so on. A really cool other part of Stan Stanford besides the GSB, so if you're in the GSB or the law school, uh, check out Stanford Technology Venture Program, and there are a couple places we can think of to how, to, how to do that. Um, I got very interested in Asia, um, China in particular, and then Singapore is the gateway to China, so I've been working with the National University of Singapore since 1998, and go down there a couple of times a year to teach entrepreneurship. Um, I snorkel along with Jill, and Palau is the best snorkeling on Earth. And it's the best diving on Earth, I've been told as well, by divers. So if you have that in your blood, um, go to Palau and uh, tell me before you go, because then I can introduce you to a family that will take very good care of you when you go. They, they're the parents of a Stanford alumna, um, and they're really cool. Ilana Seed is the Stanford alum. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details here. I have a passion for clean tech that's manifest in the Clean Tech Open. Uh, Lena Rumfeld and uh, uh, Jonas Kelberg are two Swedes who co-authored this book and grabbed me to do it with them called Gear Up. You'll hear a little bit more about that later. Um, it's a lot of fun and it's a good toolkit to allow you to, take, uh, to create new markets or to um, disrupt existing markets. Silicon Valley is not a place, right? There's no sign on 101 or 280. Whoops. Uh, there's way too much traffic, guys, right? I mean, some of, I, we can remember what it was like when the traffic was not as bad as it is. Although when David was talking about the 90s, I can remember when the traffic sort of peaked and then it went down and now it's getting back again. Um, and in Beijing, they would say, no longer are you the highest concentration of startups in the world. 
And what most of us know is Silicon Valley has lots of competition from places like Beijing and Shanghai and Tel Aviv and Singapore and lots of other places that want to take over. And I think of this as a network of Silicon Valleys that can work together to create value across borders. In terms of the, what's happened to the Valley since I got here, I came out first in 1980, but long before me, um, there were fruit orchards. Most of you know that. Steve Jobs even talks about it. Um, from the 40s to the 60s, this was mainly a military town with aerospace and defense. And you can see some of the companies that started to come in. In the 70s, this was semiconductor capital of the world. That's why Silicon in Silicon Valley. And Intel is an example. HP came about um, actually earlier, much earlier than the 70s. And then came the 70s and 80s, and companies like Apple in 1976, Genentech a few years later, Cisco in the 1980s. These are household names. These are companies. How many of you have worked for at least one company on that list? How many of you worked for at least one? How many of you might be interested in working for at least one company on that list, right? <laughs> that, this is a pretty interesting place. eBay and Yahoo and Google and NanoSolar and Facebook and Tesla and YouTube and Twitter and so on. I think what David thinks that even in the worst of times, it's the best of times because even when the rest of the world's hitting bottom, if you can figure out what the next new thing is and get at it, you will have a beautiful, beautiful life, even when the macro economy's in the toilet. These are VC trends in Silicon Valley, and um, it's, I don't have the, the latest couple of quarters. Do you guys, what's happened lately? Is it flattened. sort of flattened out? And what this basically says is, even though there's more venture capital in Silicon Valley than there is anywhere on Earth, there are a lot of entrepreneurs trying to get access to that capital. So there's scarcity in the land of plenty. And part of what you'll learn by working with both Bill and David over the course of this course, and all the other VCs who come in with their entrepreneurs, is you're gonna get insight on how to extract cash from very smart people. And that's an important skill if you're gonna be an effective entrepreneur. Knowing how to do the ask in such a way that they're passionate. By the time you ask, and as David and Bill will both tell you, if you do it right, you don't even have to ask, right? You've gotta have them more excited about your business than even you are. Stanford is considered the birthplace of the new Silicon Valley because a guy named Fred Terman who was a professor in the engineering school, was tired of the fact that his students kept going back east to go to work. He talked Bill Hewlett and David Packard and their spouses into coming back to California. The wives worked so the guys could uh, work for nothing in their garage in Palo Alto. They invented technology that Disney bought, and then Hewlett Packard, and then there were many other companies. And um, uh, Fred Terman did that in a lot of ways. And he also rented land close to Stanford to startups and made it very easy for then graduate students and undergrads and, and faculty to go back and forth to the startups, which is why Stanford is so embedded in the Valley. Currently, the Dean of the School of Engineering says, these are the technology areas that we think are the future. But he says, in addition to that, in the engineering school, we think you've got to do both research and teaching and entrepreneurship. You've got to help those scientists and engineers understand how to grow their businesses because they're not gonna do anywhere near as good a job growing that technology if they don't know how to be entrepreneurs. And that's why Stanford Technology Ventures Program was allowed to come into the School of Engineering. Um, here, we're basically saying, from the, the days of Fred Terman, so this is in the 1930s when Hewlett and Packard were founded, until today, lots of mixing it up with industry. You guys know because from this campus, you can get out and see more companies in startups and venture investors than at any school in the universe. Even on Pluto, there is not, there is not a school that is closer to uh, entrepreneurship. Research funding um, comes a lot from government agencies into the folks that are in the engineering and sciences areas. And um, Silicon Valley's right next door. We know that the students are the basic deal here, not the faculty. And uh, that's why we, we say what makes Silicon Valley different from everywhere else is live and let live. It's okay to fa fail, and we believe in the young. And I learn more from a group of 20 and 30-somethings when I teach than I can give back. Hopefully, and usually, I give back enough that they let me keep coming back for more, but it's, uh, it's clearly a two-way street. And there are all sorts of things um, with entrepreneurship on campus. You can see the, the different student-led organizations. Are any of you, some of you are members of some of these. Raise your hand if you're in at least one of them. Yay, I know there's some, so basis, what else, what else have we got? Okay, any other ones besides basis? All right. Fantastic. 
Yes, fantastic. So talk to each other about these organizations. If you're not in any of them, get in. They're really good. Um, so I'm not going to do circles of influence, I don't think. I could go 20 minutes and finish, or I could stop. 15 or 20, what do I have? 20. Just a little bit. More. Okay, okay, so um, you can see that the top 100 people in Silicon Valley included yours truly, yeah. Ernestine Fu. Just uh, had to get that in. There's a model for how to think about Silicon Valley and other entrepreneurial places. It says you need players who are going to bet on you. You need stakes, whatever it is that they want to invest in you in the business. And the code is the way that you earn their trust. These are players in Silicon Valley. You can read faster than I can talk. We'll be talking and dealing with this all quarter, so I won't do anything more than that. And we're going to give you the slide deck. It's changed since 2000. Think about the importance of Goldman Sachs and NASDAQ back in the day. Look at what's happened in 2013. First of all, there, were, there were no, so, was no social media in 2000. It's hard to imagine what it was like before Google and Facebook and so on. Um, Accelerators and incubators are on the rise. Stardex is a great example. There are many more. That's 15 minutes. Um, and the firms formerly known as investment banks have a lot more sway than they used to. Um, I still think you've got to have Goldman Sachs or, or Morgan Stanley or Chase or somebody good who's helping you. The US government is not high on its influence for good reasons. The US government has basically uh, done more to screw up uh, things for Silicon Valley than in the last few years, and, it, and I don't mean President Obama, Obama, please. I mean the friction between parties and Congress and all of that sort of stuff. Here are stakes, money time, uh, talent, technology, customers, your reputation, and um, of course, your families. That's the thing up in the upper left. And passion, the thing that David talked about so eloquently. The code is the way you earn people's trust, and it's different in Silicon Valley than it is in New York City or Dallas, and it's certainly different in Singapore or Shanghai, as Stephanie would know or in, um, in Paris or anywhere else. And so you have to think about how to earn trust of people from different cultures. And because you have a culturally diverse class, ask people from somewhere else from where you live, how would I build trust with investors, with customers, and so on? And um, I'm not going to go into detail. I'll simply say that um, there are mountains in the valley, right? So you don't ask for help in the biomedical industry for me because I don't know jack about it. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is uh, we did a study to say what percent of the people who have MBAs in the top 21 VC firms in Silicon Valley are from what schools. You can see that Stanford has a disproportionate share. And the guy from Cal Berkeley said, where's Cal Berkeley? And I said, well, it's in the all other because it was less than 2%. <laughs> we, did, we did the thing again in, in uh, 2008 and Cal finally got on the, got on the boards with uh, 3%. But what you might ask is what is it about the fact that Stanford Graduate School of Business is where it is that causes so many of them to be here in the Valley. And also, interestingly, Harvard Business School is a long way from here. It's a lot further away than Cal Berkeley and then UCLA and so on. How is it that Harvard is so preeminent? I actually know a lot about both of those things um, because we studied it, if you want to learn about that more during the quarter. It's OK to fail as long as you don't blame your investors. And remember, chasm crossing can be fun. So I think that we have time for a few quick questions for Tom. Quick, quick. No questions, yeah. I mean, Well, I know a lot of you have yeah, classes. Yeah, so. so I've worked with um, some like newer or young uh, sort of that are like on either web or uh, mobile, and they have a really hard time like marketing. Right? The marketing department is basically surprising them running clear Facebook pages and, and buying Facebook ads. Like a, a new young uh, web company, like. How do you suggest they go about marketing uh, and acquiring users? So um, it will depend on the kind of uh, target customers that they have. And I would love to talk to you more about that after class. But one thing I would encourage them to do is go to the Global Entrepreneurial Marketing course, which runs two quarters a year at Stanford. And you can have teams of students with a very accomplished faculty member literally work with you to figure out how to get the marketing job done. And that's not the only place to get it done. I think that they can. If they take advantage of the um, expertise that is here at Stanford, at Cal Berkeley, and St Santa Clara, San Jose State, and so on, they can actually have people work for free for them to help them get traction. And people who know a lot about marketing who love startups who work for free. Yes? Um, Tom, can you take a view on, uh, it seems to be just like a murmur in the valley about um, the importance of doing startups that matter. Um, and, and the fact that the, the market has a lot of startups that see, uh, at least in the surface, that have papers in the country. Um, 
Well, I think what matters is in the eye of the user, kind of like beauty. And I would say if Twitter can cause um, the, the Arab Spring to happen, I wouldn't call it trivial technology. So I think, um, look, uh, what you want to do is make sure that you're working in an adventure that matters to you. And if you really care and if you think it can have impact on the world, and if there's a segment of customers who believes you and will pay you enough money that you can grow the business, screw everybody else. Because what matters is subjective, and, and different people will often have different opinions about what matters. Okay? Is that it? <coughs> Thank you, guys. Um, so, last but not least, I have Bill Coleman here. Bill, I'm going to just ask you three quick questions. Um, okay, I one. actually have three. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, the first one was just to go over your background as um, an entrepreneur. Uh, okay, so. They, they send us a long list, as Tom said, and uh, you know. Mine was longer than yours. Yeah, but at uh, any rate, so I, I started with me, and I said, so uh, let's see, I was a nerd turned CEO turned VC turned CEO turned VC, and um, I seemed to always fail at being the nerd side because they always made me in charge of the projects and then uh, moved up for that. Uh, but I came out here in 1971, so I beat you by a little bit. Uh, in the Air Force, uh, the end of the. The valley was uh, aerospace, and uh, was in the blue cube doing satellite operations, developing systems there, and then ended up uh, uh, responsible for a, a satellite system. And uh, decided I really liked the valley, so I came here and uh, got a master's degree in computer science and computer engineering, and um, went to a big, uh, uh, still an aerospace company. It was GTE Government Systems. And we did these systems to automate, um, to automate collection for NSA. It's unclassified now, but it was the first ever three-tier systems. We had the first ever programmable terminal. Uh, we used a VAX. So probably most of you haven't heard of it, but it was a big, it was a real breakthrough in the in the late 1970s computer in the background and the yeah. signal processing in the end. And we created a three-tier system. And it was great, and uh, the the the. I was responsible for the little frontier part of it, and it worked pretty well, and the rest of the system was a year late, so they put me in charge of the whole thing, and I said, well, we don't know how to do these big systems, so let's break out into small. And I took a $12 million business unit and turned it into a $36 million one in 18 months, and then they, my boss said, well, your, your group's too big, we have to break it up. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I said, we're the most profitable group by dollars in the, in the division, and he said, well, if we promote you one more time, you'll be 16 years younger than any other vice president at that level of GTE. And I said, well, that's why I got out of the Air Force. So I went to work for a small startup called Personal Software Inc., first software experience. We were the, actually the first ever personal software company. And we were doing all the games and all that kind of stuff. And we had this one little program that was really starting to make, like, go, get successful. I really enjoyed using it. Uh, I will bet you less than a third of you have ever heard of VisiCalc. It was the first ever spreadsheet. It's what made Apple successful, actually. Um, and uh, so we, we renamed it VisiCorp. We also invented the first ever, you may be the only one that has heard of Vizion, yes. right? It was the first ever Windows system running on a PC. And uh, Bill Gates came to it, came, came to us, looked at it, asked me to show him where the VAX was running behind it, because he thought it was being running on a big mini computer. And then he hired Scott McGregor, and they built uh, Windows 1.0. But uh, this is where I learned in my startup experience is uh, it, it, it's not if you build it, they will come. I mean, we built this system that was, was at least seven years in advance of Windows 3.0, and it did basically all of Windows 3.0 did. Uh, but it did cost $10,000 to buy, and in 1983, that was a lot of money. So uh, we ended up selling out the company to, uh, to CSC. I did another startup. And uh, right in the face of a depression, and, uh, and we built a great product. People loved it. Couldn't get any more money. Uh, the VCs ran away. So I, went to, I decided, well, I'll go be a VC. I did that for six months. And uh, it, it wasn't really a VC. It was an incubator. We were now a VC. It's called Onset Partners. And we were funded by NEA, Mayfield, and Kleiner. And we were to find them new stuff, right? And I was the tech guy. And after about six months of doing that, I said, you know, I'm an operating guy. You know, it's like. It's great to help these guys, but I, I'd like to have my hands on. So I went to uh, 
an, uh, another relative startup at the time was about 30 million in revenue called Sun Microsystems. Uh, I co-founded the federal division. Co I founded the professional service division and I ran software development when we built uh, Solaris and what became Java, et cetera. And uh, then, uh, uh, then we formed all these business units and Ed Zander got a pro promoted ahead of me and I go, well, I guess this isn't the place for me, so I started uh, uh, BEA Systems. Uh, I w uh, actually, what I did is I, we had gone public and we were uh, flushing money, so I bought a place in Aspen and we moved up there for the winter, and, you know, and Scott convinced me to not quit but to take an unpaid leave of absence. So while I was there, about 30 days into skiing, I went, is that all there is? Mm -hmm. you know, it's what you always dream of, but, and I love skiing. I raced for 20 years. but. Uh, so one morning I woke up and I go, ah, Net Sun's model used to be the network's the computer. I go, if the network's going to be the computer, the network needs an operating system, something that made distribution free for applications so people didn't have to program that in. And um, so I came up with a concept that we now call a web app server. And I recruited a couple other uh, got, uh, spent about a couple months working on it. Scott, that's when Scott asked me to come back to found professional services, which I did. But I told him I'm only going to do it for 18 months because I've got to build this plan, recruit some founders, and get some money. So I did. And 18 months later, I left with my, I recruited my two partners, Ed and Alfred. That's BEA, Bill, Ed, and Alfred. And we, uh, we raised $50 million, Series A, biggest raise uh, at that point ever for a software company. Um, that, uh, that was the only money we ever raised. Uh, they, uh, Six years later, Warburg had taken 8.3 billion out of that 50 and still had a, a little bit left. And um, so that went, that went really well. Uh, but I, you know, it's be careful what you ask for. God, I'm gonna retire, I'm gonna go up to Aspen, I'm gonna do some philanthropy and I'll keep my hand into, into BEA. So I said, okay, I'm gonna step back. As soon as we reach a billion in revenue in, in four quarters, August of 2001, pick good timing to do it, uh, step back. 9-11 uh, happened and poor Alfred got the worst of it. Um, I was affiliated with a company f sort of full-time for the next year and a half, you know, just helping out with sales, being, uh, you know, consulting here and there. Uh, and then there, then there was another, is that all there is? So I founded another company to build a cloud, private cloud automation system, um, which uh, actually went pretty well until, uh, until late 08, we were about five million a quarter. Um, matter of fact, the, the, the last qu the quarter that s spanned the end of 08, 09, beginning of 09, after Lehman went down, was a, uh, we had 9.4 million in bookings, and of course, nobody had any money. So uh, most of it evaporated. I go, well, if I try to raise money now, it's going to, value's going to be zero. So I sold the company to a CA. And, uh, said, oh, I don't ever want to be a, uh, a CEO again. So um, not yet. It, it wasn't that I didn't want to be a CEO. I didn't want to work 24-7. And in a CEO job, especially in a startup, you, you're never really off. So I, uh, I took a year. I did some skiing. And I helped out with a lot of startups in trouble then. I helped out with six different startups, sold a couple of them off. And then uh, one of the people I was working with were uh, Stuart Alsop and Gilman Louie, I'd, who I'd known for decades. And uh, that's Alsop Louie where I'm affiliated now. And they made me a deal I couldn't refuse. So I said, this is great. I get to work with startups. I don't have to be 24-7. Well, as of next week, I'm going to be full-time VC and a full-time CEO of one of our companies. So <laughs> failed at that again. So that's the, uh, any rate, it's really an honor. Uh, there were about 132 ref uh, people who applied for this course, and we went through all the resumes. I think 27 were accepted. You guys are awesome. I could not be accepted into Stanford now. I mean, this, uh, uh, you, you really have to get to meet each other. Your, your, your breadths of experience are great, so I think we're going to learn as much from you as anybody else. Uh, do you want to ask me the questions, or do you want me to do what I was going to do next from your notes? Up to you. you can okay. You well, I was going to do two things. Uh, quickly, I was going to give you uh, this is my, my top 10 for, 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 for start, if you're going to do a startup uh, to think about. And then I was going to do real quickly current outlook uh, that I see in uh, the Valley right now, or the world, period, in, in this sort of entrepreneur startup thing. So 
my top 10 start with what I call the three V's. I think this is the most important thing. That's his, uh, it's vision, value, and values. Everything starts there. You gotta have a vision of a, a tr that's, that's transforming, compelling, and can build, and uh, from which you can build a credible strategy. That vision has to be based on value, customer value. If you can't tie anything to why a customer would urgently need, and you can distinguish yourself for that customer, it doesn't matter. That's, I mean, that's it, and that's what people forget a lot. And the third one is values, and that's his code. People buy from people. People, you know, you, they, 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 they come to work for you because they, they believe, they, they sense, they understand your values, you're the same. Values, culture is important, values are much more important in anything to do with a startup. So looking at vision, the vision has to be about the ability to affect the future. It has to be about looking at wh what's going on and seeing where change is happening and finding out what's, what kind of a disruption you can play to that you can uniquely bring a capa capability. The, um, the, the, and, and it can be a transformative one where, where, a market's where an existing market is changing and where, where a technology or a new capability added to it can, can really leverage that in a distinguishable way. Or what you really would like is to find a um, disruptive innovation that is disintermediating what's come before it. This value proposition is such that the incumbents have the innovator's dilemma, so they can't actually attack it, and the customers are looking at it saying, wait a minute, this is an order of magnitude better than what they have today, therefore I, I want to do it. It's those that created all the big names you know, except for maybe IBM and Hewlett Packard. Every disruptive innovation over the last 40 years in this valley has resulted in the big names that you know, that were, but they were always a startup, because only a startup can actually, and Darwin selects which startup, can actually rise to that, that, rise to that level while the, innovator, while the incumbents are all trying to say, oh, but we'll get there in a few years. Well, I can't wait for a few years because it's a disruptive innovation. It's not just transformative. So that's what you'd really like to find. Um, the value proposition, it not only has to be important and compelling, but for a startup, if you're coming into a, a marketplace, it's gotta be urgent. People don't write that check at the end of a quarter on something that's important. They write it only if it's urgent, something that the board, whatever, and especially if it's to a startup. So that gives you the opportunity to get in, and then you need to find a way to position yourself such that you uniquely, ab above anybody else, can solve that. In that case, you can get in, you don't have to go through RFPs and everything else. This is the, the so those are the first three. Okay, and then team. You've heard this over and over again. It all starts with team and, it's all, and it all starts with passion. You know, there's a lot of people who want to start startups because it sounds like a great idea and everybody's important and exciting and I get to run out and I can immediately be a CEO or a head of engineering or a CTO or whatever. It's not important. What's important is passion for doing what you're doing that actually will change the world in some way. And that's what we look for, for in a team. When I started BEA, I said I wanted uh, a couple other founders. I decided I wanted to run it with only four members on the team. Myself, someone who ran everything that touched products, every, someone who ran everything that touched customers, and someone who ran everything else. But I decided that I, I wanted him not to go, I wanted him to not to have to learn on the job. So my, requ my requirements were very simple. Uh, best I could find it what they did, but I wanted him to have been an executive in a high growth uh, large company, an executive in a startup, and been in through one fail, failure because the failure is where you learn infinitely more than anything else, and all four of us had that. We never would have been able to grow from zero to a billion in six years uh, without that. Um, a successful startup is a learning machine. At Sun, we did everything wrong you can imagine. There was a point when Sun 2 was out there, we had 50% failures off the production line. We had no escalation process for uh, for problems that were called in. If they had to know an engineer to call, right? The, thing, the good news was we never did anything wrong long. You got it, you're, no matter what, no matter what your plan is, it's gonna go wrong. Or you're gonna be misfocused or you're gonna misjudge the real value proposition. You, ha you, you have to be a learning machine. You have to always have that feedback. And engage with customers very early and often. 
because that's when you're going to find out what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. Don't go, I'm going to spend three years and build my product and then I'm going to go out there and they're going to love it. Then you're going to find out you're going to drop back two and a half years and you've got, you've got to start all over again. Um, cash is king. Cash, as Mark Leslie says, is oxygen. You run out of oxygen, you die. Watch every penny. Hi, it's, and it's mostly about people to begin with. Only hire those that you need and only hire the best. Great people hire great people. Average people hire average people. If you build an ad, the first 20 people you ever hire are going to dictate the whole future of your company, period. Be really, really careful on that. The next three are pretty easy. The three stages of a, of a startup. Validation, calibration, and scale. The first stage is you've got to validate your product or offering. It brings real value. You got to do that by building it, working with, with the customers, uh, et cetera, while you're doing it, getting that feedback. But validation doesn't happen until you prove that, that you, can, you can sell or get an economic return that actually is scalable into, uh, ultimately, from real customers. They're not just out there playing with it, taking free services or getting it at a big discount. You've got to get beyond that. You've proven that customers get enough value out of it, they're actually willing to pay for it. Second stage is what almost everybody misses, calibration. A lot of companies get, can get a real early start, but they've never calibrated their distribution sales uh, and support models. And so what happens, when, when the sales starts taking off, they hire lots of people, but they don't actually have the training and the tools and the processes and the systems in place that allow them to really understand how to make people productive in selling, how to get their customers fast, how to reduce the, the costs of sales, et cetera. And so it, it costs go, out of, uh, go through the roof, they end up with a big pipeline with almost nothing coming out the end. You really gotta go through that calibration. But once you've done that, especially if you're in an early market, you should be able to scale your sales as fast as you can scale your channel. Uh, and finally, have fun. Remember, this is going to be hard work, but have fun. You know, you're, you're building a team. Have fun with your team. Make sure you enjoy it, and, uh, and it, it'll be very rewarding. So I'll spend a couple of minutes, a few more minutes, on, uh, on my outlook. I'm trying to get everything fast. First, we're in the greatest, we're right now, I think, this decade, at the center inflection point, on, uh, which is the greatest inflection point in human history. And um, sounds like I'm a lot of <coughs> hyperbole, but when I'm talking about uh, inflection points, I'm talking about, uh, there's a, first I'll say there's a, this is the third one in human history. And the inflection points have to, have to do with uh, a point in which we reach a geometric increase in the quantity and quality of communication on the one hand and the rate of knowledge creation on the other hand. There's only been two before this. The first was the invention of language. That started the great collective that started down in the uh, southern Africa and went up to the Great Crescent, et cetera, where we started to organize and figure out how to, uh, to do, do a few things. The second was the printing press uh, that now we could actually have uh, knowledge that was passed on, passed on in, a, in, a great, uh, in a greater way and maintained uh, going forward. And the third is what we're doing right now. What, what we've, what's happened right now is the internet now, when, when, the, when the internet went out in the 90s, for the first time we had free reach to everybody and everything. That means any, gr any, in, any group of individuals or any individual uh, interests could organize in any way you want at no cost, instantaneously. Well, the, what that means now that w is we built the first platform on it, and that's just social. The next platform is how we connect that and tr really create the business models and the interactions that'll, take poli that'll change politics and business and everything else. I call that the, I call that the web. Um, and that's really going to change everything because there are two th the, the two things that are happening here now that lead to what, um, what's going to be the greatest creation of value in history, which I believe will happen in the next 10 to 20 years, is two mega platforms that are, you know, pl platforms are what I use to go back each 10 years to say we have a new platform based on a disruptive innovation and that's where all these startups like Intel and Cisco and Microsoft and EMC and all came from. But we've had those, they're just all incremental. We have two now that are massively different. 
The first is the cloud, because the cloud is the last disruptive innovation for ICT. That's the SIC code for, for IT and communications. Basically, everything is gonna be IP-based, running on something that's computed or transmitted or stored in the cloud going forward. More and more, that's gonna turn into a utility. It's gonna dramatically drop costs and availability. It's, gonna, it's going to then allow the ends to be in charge. So on the one hand, we're, we are building out that last phase. No matter what happens to computing, communications, or storage, after that, it's not going to disintermediate, disintermediate the cloud. It's not gonna replace it. Quantum computing only makes it faster. It doesn't change the fact of what we're doing. So there's so innovation going on like crazy to build that out, to make it secure, to fix our identity, to all the, all the kind of problems that are going on there. The other side is social turning into the web. And I, that's the other mega, because there are, there are, there are basically th three things that lead to free lunches that the internet brings. Free reach I've already talked about. The next is straight through processing. How do I connect and be able to do things in real time across that so I can change every business model and turn the whole chain of commerce from push, which has been since the first industrial revolution, into pull, which is mass market to micro market, to real time, to you know, we're, uh, we're, we're not gonna manufacture anymore, we're gonna print, and we're gonna do it on demand. I mean, things are gonna change so dramatically, and so that's, that's what's, happening, what's happening during this decade. We are building out the part to make those connections happen, and the last part is how do we then take all that information that's gonna go up dramatically, and in real time be able to create an ontology that can understand, based on the context of what your problem is, what the situation is, and then the world can serve you. And that's gonna take a, a, another number of years, but those are, the three, those are the three free lunches of the internet. Well, those actually change everything about economics, politics, how we live, whatever. Both of those platforms are going through the build-out stages from which they will be, the value will be built during this decade, and they're being accelerated by mobile. So, my final point is, this val there's never been as much innovation going on in this valley as there is right now, never. Now, the valley is, is maybe just a state of consciousness, but usually, but until the last 15 years, the valley really, most of the startups were pretty well contained south of, uh, of 92. There are more startups in San Francisco in the last 18 months than there are in Silicon Valley. We're really stretching it now. I mean, this place is just going crazy. It's going to be, you're, you're gonna live through some of the most exciting time. And it's even more exciting than that because I'm talking about the end of ICT and, and mobile, but now let's put on top of that the convergence, uh, the, the, the next revolution, I call this the, we call this the information revolution. I call the next revolution, you all will live through it, probably, the dematerialization. Because when, where bio meets nano, there's, there's no difference. We can, do, we can do anything. The Star Trek food synthesizer will be a daily thing you know, by the end of this century. Now, just one final point. The advancement of humankind has all had to do with advancement in productivity. The amount of, amount of resources expended for what you get back. So from, from the uh, 14,000 years ago to about 400 years ago, according to studies Sloan did, uh, productivity raised about 30%. I mean, 30% of our time we could build cities and have schools and have an army and go fight wars and maybe have some business. During the Industrial Revolution, first and second, 100% increase. Now we have middle classes and all sorts of stuff like that. Their estimate is the next century it will be 1,000%. That will take the world out of the, the, of the need for poverty. That will take us above anything we know. So, uh, you know, I really envy you where you are at your careers. You know, I read an article the other day that, that predicted that the first person that will live to be 150 years old is alive today. Of course, we'll have to figure out how to regenerate organs and things like that, but have fun. <laughs>
Uh, I, uh, there are, there are two, in my view of it, there are two sources of, uh, of entrepreneurial teams. There are mid-career executives who come out and what we're usually doing is uh, the next step of, of an obvious evolution, but it's usually pretty technically you know, uh, sophisticated uh, and involves a lot of business uh, understanding. Um, and the re and those er the, those why are there more though, why are there more of those here than anywhere else in the world? Because there's more technical companies here, and we have histories and et cetera. The second are those right out of u universities, right? And those, uh, at least in my appear in my in my view, uh, uh, they're they're usually very high in passion. They're, they're dealing with something that is really exciting, maybe on the edge of technology or on, the e or on the edge of innovation, but it isn't necessarily even, it's not obvious what the, what the path to monetization is. I mean, uh, they, but they, they invent it, they get it going, and then Darwin works there as well. Uh, you know, there, how many people, that, what were there, 148, the number I heard at one point in the late 90s, search engines funded in, uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, in, in the uh, whatever, in, the ink to me's and all this sort of stuff. But those two guys figured out how to make it mu make it much better and faster. Right at the point when we transitioned from dial-up 56k modems till Wi-Fi and 3G started to happen, and that's when you needed it fast. And that's when search was important. None of us did much searching when you had to listen to the old and then wait, you know, and you type it in and a minute later it comes back, no, that isn't it, you type it. Nobody did much searching. All of a sudden, uh, around 2000, 2001, Wi-Fi was going into homes and 3G was starting to go out. They were perfect timing, you know, but so it's sort of, and, and of course there's gray area all the way in between. But what I was talking about was what I, what I used. Um, the uh, most of us my age wouldn't imagine half the things that are being invented that have come out. I mean, uh, but but look at I mean you probably all saw the the movie uh, uh, you know uh, about Facebook and Zuckerberg and all. But it was you know they, they, there was a passion. They, first they're having fun in their dorms. They were doing things with girls' pictures, and then they're doing it for Harvard. And then you know it just it grew. And that passion word is the. Can you talk a little bit about kind of calibration and how you thought about that in some? Uh, well, the, the, the key, see, we, my business have all been in direct distribution. It's so much easier these days. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the key there is you, 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 won't, you don't hire a lot of, of sales of folks. You hire a couple of small teams. And, uh, and basically what you're doing is you're working with the teams and you work with customers to understand the, uh, the, the entire dynamics of your sales cycle. The first thing you have to understand, you know, is what, wh why is the customer, re why, why the customers that are buying, why are they really buying? What's the real value proposition? There are two, there's some two important things for that. One, you learn how to qualify. Must, much more important, learning how to disqualify. Do not spend your time uh, in markets that aren't ready to buy, do not spend your time with customers who just love to play with technology, but there's no urgent problem. When you learn, when, when you learn what it takes to qualify a customer and to disqualify everybody else out, then, and then you learn what resources it takes, then you start figuring out, okay, how do I, I have to hire how many folks for pre-sales, how many folks for post-sales support, how do I get those processes so they are scalable and it doesn't cost huge amounts of money, and I, and, I, and I can take that time from six months from the time I engage a customer until I start get the payment, get down to three or four months. It takes about a year. But once you've done that, now you, have the, you, you, know how to, you know who you need to hire, you know how you need to train them, you've developed the tools and the collateral, you've got the processes that generate the leads or, or whatever, however you're doing it, and, and that makes it repeatable and also makes it measurable. If you can reduce it down to a, you know, a we, I had four sets of predictive uh, metrics that I used to, uh, to understand the, the sales dynamic on a, uh, during a quarter, week by week. Um, yeah. So what were those four metrics? I'm just curious. Uh, 
Yeah. OK, I'll have to. Uh, so the first one's the easiest one. That's the, the, bottoms, that's the bottoms up sales forecast for your, uh, from, from all your sales organizations. And you, and you, you, run a, uh, you, we, you run a calibration on those to figure out, uh, you know, this guy is usually over, under, whatever. And so that, that can be done. That we have a, you have a tops down that's done by, by sales management. You, we have a historic, we, uh, I created a historic metric that, uh, that looked at, and it takes you, uh, it take about six quarters to calibrate, but it looks at, based on what percentage, you know, you, when you have a sales process, you'll have a whole set of steps, you know, starting with, you know, you identify the lead all the way till you've got the PO. So you identify starting, you know, it, the, the steps that are critical, they're usually the last three or four steps, and you determine how much of, based on how many dollars or how many deals come into each step, what percentage would normally move to the next step during the quarters, et cetera, going forward. And that'll give you a prediction. And the final prediction is just a capacity model. And the capacity model is you, gotta, you create a productivity model of the sales force by how many people you have, by how many quarters they've, they've, they've been there, and you run that through, and I always derated that by 15%. And when you run all those together, by, uh, by the second year, I could tell by the fifth day of the quarter, within 5%, how much we book each quarter. And it also gives you a way each year to figure out, okay, planning for next year, if I want to get X percent growth, I have to hire this many people at this rate, derate it by this, derate your forecasts. And so in the 36, um, I'm sorry, in the 23 quarters we were public that I ran the company, every quarter, I raised, uh, I raised the guidance, and, I, uh, and every quarter but two, I raised, uh, raised the guidance for the top line. Every quarter but two, I raised the guidance for the bottom line. Let's give it, uh, all the a round of applause. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.